So, um, all right, did it just switch off to, uh, well, okay. All right, uh, so today we're gonna be talking about advanced care planning. Much of our discussion is gonna involve um, healthcare, advanced healthcare directives. But basically what we're going to be talking about is planning to appoint somebody to make healthcare decisions for you um, at any time that you are no longer capable of making those decisions yourself. And quite importantly, giving those people guidelines so those people never think they are making their own decisions for you, uh, but instead are just there as your spokesperson and are essentially communicating for you to your healthcare providers what treatments you would and would not want if you could communicate those decisions yourself. Uh, Katie also will touch on the, at the end on the physician order for life-sustaining treatment. Um, and that will, uh, uh, is an important supplement to you know, complement the healthcare directive. They are not a substitute for each other. And I will also talk about uh, some of the, uh, integration between your advanced healthcare directive and financial decision makers with respect to uh, your estate, if you are not capable of managing your own funds, which presumably is going to be the case if you are not capable of making your own healthcare decision. So, um, and I'm gonna talk, I think for the first few slides and then Katie will talk most of it and I'll chime in um, when I, think it's appropriate and she'll chime in on my presentation uh, when she thinks it's appropriate. So an advanced healthcare directive is a written set of instructions where number one, you appoint a person or persons to make healthcare decisions for you in the event you cannot make those decisions on your own. It is possible to have more than one healthcare decision maker. I caution people against that because if, for example, you have three kids and you say majority rule, I think there's a pretty good chance that if it's two to one, for example, to uh, decline some life-saving treatment that you wouldn't want, but there's one dissenter who says, you know, give him the treatment, uh, the hospital is likely to go say, go get a court order if you want us to uh, discontinue treatment. So I think it's important from a very practical perspective to have a primary decision maker, and you could have a secondary decision maker if that primary decision maker is not available. Uh, but the important point is that you put your desires in writing. And, and, you know, for a lot of people, they don't think about healthcare directives until they are diagnosed with cancer or some other disease, uh, progressive or not, or you know, end up in the hospital and the hospital says, oh, do you have a healthcare directive? And would you like to do one now, which is probably not high on everybody's list of uh, priorities when you're admitted to the hospital. Uh, it's actually important if you have children who are going off to college who turn 18 to get them to do their healthcare directive because, and a HIPAA authorization. HIPAA is the privacy law that was well intended, but uh, just kills a lot of trees and probably doesn't achieve the ends it was supposed to. But if uh, your kids have not appointed you or somebody else as their agent under their health care directive and they're at a university and they end up in the hospital, the, ho the university and the hospital will not talk to you um, because your kids are adults and you are not their agent and there's no HIPAA authorization. So it really is important. It's also noteworthy that the first case to get to the U.S. Supreme Court with respect to health care directives was from a woman named Nancy Cruzan, who was 22 when she got into the car accident that put her into a persistent vegetative state. So it's not just for older people or people who've been diagnosed with illnesses. And generally, you know, the healthcare directive can be called different things in different states. Um, some call it a durable power of attorney for healthcare. California, uh, some call it a directive to physician. Uh, California has really combined both of those uh, in a single document, which is generally known as a an advanced healthcare directive. And in addition to appointing um, appointing agents to make decisions for you, uh, there's also some choices that the various forms of healthcare directives 
have in terms of what you would want, what you wouldn't want. And I think Katie's going to touch more on some of those issues. But what I will say is this. Um, lots of attorneys, including myself, could spend an hour explaining to you why it's better to have an attorney drafted healthcare directive because there's a lot of things attorneys could cover that others don't. But from a practical standpoint, and I actually confirmed this with an emergency room physician uh, last week, just because it's been my understanding for a number of years, but I'd never asked them. Um, and that is that there's three primary forms that are known throughout the state of California. The one from the California Medical Association, the one from the California Hospital Association, and the one from, uh, it's called the statutory directive. Essentially, the legislature has, has, has drafted a directive that can be used. Uh, the links to the California Hospital Association and the statutory forms are on the last slide and the resources. The California Medical Association charges for their forms, so there is no link uh, to the form. And those four, if, if you have an attorney drafted healthcare directive uh, and it gets into the ER or the ICU, it's going to go to legal. If it is a CMA form, CHA form, or statutory directive, the personnel in the emergency room or the ICU have uh, greater comfort in, in reviewing what was said in the directive and then acting hopefully accordingly, according to the instructions uh, from the agent. So I really think as much as uh, I'm not a big fan of form documents, the, these are one form that I think is better than any custom drafted form. It doesn't mean you can't add your own instructions to it, but it does mean if you start out with the fundamental form, uh, from one of these organizations or the statutory form, uh, they're going to work better on it from a very practical standpoint. Uh, there's a few, uh, uh, the American Bar Association, and, and one of the things I tell Pete clients when I'm not on my solo agent solutions hat, that's a separate company from my law firm, but when I'm acting as an estate planning attorney, I tell clients that, you know, when I've drafted legal documents for you and you haven't read every line or every page, um, I feel comfortable having you sign them because it's certainly, at least in my opinion, better than what you've got if you have anything. But with healthcare directives, it is very personal. It is more, in my mind, personal rather than legal, although the one thing that's essential, at least in California, is that the um, directions for healthcare be committed to writing. So uh, you need to review the healthcare directive. You need to make sure, and Katie's going to talk about selecting the appropriate person. And it's an ongoing process. Um, you know, a lot of times that means that what you might talk about in your 60s is going to be different than in your 70s or 80s or 90s. And your um, views on what you might and might not want are going to be different. Or within the first few years after your cancer diagnosis, then you're still not out of the blue, essentially not that you, nobody's ever guaranteed of anything, but once you're five or 10 years beyond uh, the completion of your treatment, since there's lots of survivors out there, you might look at things differently than you did uh, as you were undergoing uh, chemo or radiation. So it is important to um, update your healthcare directive uh, as your, you age and as your, your thinking change, changes. Um, one of the other issues in healthcare decision making is that there are people who are concerned that there are particular people in their lives, whether they're children, spouses, relatives, or neighbors, um, who might interfere in the healthcare decision making. For example, when people do not appoint their spouse as the, their first healthcare decision maker, uh, there's usually a reason for that. And the reason often is, is that the spouses don't agree on what each other would like to do. And the concern of the spouse who's not appointing their spouse is that that person will not honor the wishes of the person making the appointment, but will act according to their own world view. So it is possible in California, uh, if there's a declaration that is signed by an attorney about advising you, um, and that the form of that declaration is set out in the probate code, um, you can exclude certain people, and I've listed them uh, in the third paragraph of this slide, from having any influence on your healthcare decision making. The, the physicians, the healthcare providers should ignore them. If they want to run to court, the judge should ignore them because if you're essentially excluding them 
from uh, your healthcare decision making. They don't have standing to challenge it in court. It doesn't mean they might not try to. Um, and hopefully, the judge will follow your instructions. Judges really don't want to have anything to do with disputes concerning healthcare decision making. They really want everybody to resolve it outside of court because at least the probate judges I've spoken to who have been faced with these decisions are not very happy about doing it. It's generally not within their comfort level. Um, so if you are concerned about somebody interfering, then it's a, it's a really good idea to um, make sure that's in writing your healthcare directive with the required declaration from an attorney. Otherwise, healthcare directives are often made to be signed without legal advice or without attorneys. The California Medical Association form, for example, is specifically intended to not require people uh, to have an attorney. Um, unfortunately, it's often not done properly if you don't have at least somebody with experience supervising it, whether it's an attorney or, or let's say, a medical social worker who has tremendous experience in dealing with these issues. There's one other part of California law that I think a lot of uh, emergency room personnel like, but I don't, um, and that is that there's something called a surrogate. Somebody can designate, verbally designate somebody as their healthcare surrogate when they are in the hospital, and that de delegation lasts for the duration of the hospital stay. There might be a 60-day or something uh, expiration, but no longer than the duration of the hospital stay. And at least in my mind, unfortunately, the designation of the sur surrogate can take precedence over the written healthcare directive. And I think it's a potential problem because, um, you know, if you've got a spouse that you've excluded or you've got somebody else who you've excluded and they're in the hospital with you and you're obviously not in the best of shape and you get worried, you just might tell the your healthcare provider, this person is my surrogate. And all of a sudden, somebody you previously excluded um, could have an influence on, on your healthcare. And it's hard to... Uh, protect against that. Um, but it is an aspect of California law because a lot of times what, what the emergency personnel are really looking for is somebody to make a decision. Um, so, you know, that's healthcare directives, but among the decisions that a healthcare agent might be making is if somebody is discharged from the hospital, where are they going to go? Um, what facility are they going to go in? Are they going to go home uh, with caregivers? If, and, you know, the healthcare agent, if they're not in charge of finances, um, may have no familiarity with the finances. And if you want 24-7 care, uh, you know, that's $250,000 a year in our area. It's very expensive to have 24-7 care at home. Um, you know, and so whether you're in a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living or a board and care facility, those kind of decisions have to be made and there needs to be coordination between the healthcare agent and the um, people in charge of the money who are often known as the agent under a durable power of attorney for finance or property management. And also if somebody has a living trust, uh, it is generally the successor trustee of their living trust who's in charge of their trust assets if they become incapacitated. And the agent under the power of attorney for finance and the successor trustee are usually the same person. So um, one of the questions that somebody asked in advance is, what do, what, what do we do if, you know, for instance, I have my joint accounts with my spouse, but my spouse is not going to be the decision maker for my healthcare because he or she is not going to respect my wishes. That's actually a very difficult situation. Um, if somebody has a trust, uh, there are times when you know you could have a different successor trustee if you're incapacitated instead of um, after death. In other words, the person who's in charge during your incapacity could be different than the person in charge after your death. Uh, I've had clients who are concerned that if they name their kids you know, adult children um, who are uh, going to be decision makers during incapacity, they're just going to pick out the cheapest alternative. So they will happily have their children in charge of their finances after death, but not during incapacity, because um, they're most concerned about the highest quality care, as opposed to preserving their children's inheritance. So 
it's something where you really need to have some pretty extensive language in whatever documents your attorney is drafting for you and, and to figure it out because, you know, this is hard for some people, depending on the amount of money they have, is, you know, possibly the need to segregate some assets from the spouse who will not be cooperative and who will try and take control of the money and not spend the money that the agent under the healthcare directive believes needs to be spent in order to honor the uh, principal's wishes. So it is really something that needs to be discussed pretty extensively. And I say pretty extensively in writing in your state planning documents, because if they end up in court, you want a judge to see in your words what your concerns were, why it was that you didn't appoint your spouse, uh, why you, uh, you know, that they would not honor your wishes. They would not authorize the expenditure of money to honor, uh, to honor your wishes. So those things, if it's set out in your words, it makes it easier for a judge who doesn't know anybody um, to make the decision about you. Because uh, otherwise, your spouse is going to be there saying, oh, she changed her mind uh, a couple months ago and wanted me in charge even though she didn't tell anybody and didn't change her documents and your agent under the healthcare directive is going to be saying the opposite and the judge is just going to have to sort of pick. But if your language is in there as to what your concerns are, that gets a lot closer to uh, making sure your wishes are honored by a judge. Again, nobody wants this in court. Uh, hopefully your spouse will not interfere, but it is difficult to put somebody in trust in that you know, to trust somebody if they say, oh, I won't interfere, just because when it comes down to it and their loved one is possibly about to have life support withdrawn or something along those lines or treatment not given, um, yeah, it's, it's sometimes very difficult for a spouse who believes they should get whatever treatment is available to keep their mouth shut. So um, I will now... Uh, pass this on to Katie to talk about um, a lot of the very practical issues on who to select and other issues concerning your healthcare directive. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So as Ken said, um, determining who the healthcare agent is going to be in your advanced healthcare directive is probably the most important part of that document. Most people think it automatically needs to be their spouse or their adult child, but in reality, um, there are several factors that kind of come into play when selecting who you want to be your healthcare agent. First one being age and health status. A lot of people automatically want to use their spouse or maybe a sibling, and that person might be around the same age as them. So looking into the future, um, considering will that person be able to act in that capacity? Is my sister 90 and I'm 85? And by the time maybe I need her to step in, she might have her own health compromise and un be unable to um, serve in that role. Also looking at someone's health status. So if there's someone in a partnership or a marriage who has a diagnosis, you might want that person to still be your primary healthcare agent but it might be a really good idea to really consider who would be the alternate if that person didn't have the capacity um, or ability to step in and serve as your healthcare agent when it's needed. Geographic location um, and accessibility to you is also really important. In today's world of Zoom and um, FaceTime, there's so much that can be done remotely, but it really doesn't take away the ability to be there feet on the ground. I've seen working as a hospice social worker and also being on an ethics committee of a local hospital, the difficulty that people have in understanding someone's current condition if they're not present. Um, I've seen folks who have been in a vegetative state, on a ventilator, um, not showing brain activity, but when the family member who's across the country calls in to check and the nurse says, oh, he's having a good day, the family member has hope and they think, okay, that means improvement. That means we're working towards things getting better and this person coming off the ventilator or being able to function. When in reality, usually if that family member was here feet on the ground, they'd have a better idea of reality and really be able to assess for themselves um, that person's condition and probably be able to make medical decisions a little bit more comfortably. 
the ability to follow someone's healthcare instructions, which we'll dive into a little bit later, um, that don't align with their own is a really big factor in making sure you're selecting the right healthcare agent. There's a lot of religious and spiritual and cultural beliefs that we all have that might make it very difficult for someone to step outside their own belief system and follow your directions. And that might not necessarily be a role that you want to put someone in if that would go against what they believe in and would be very difficult for them. You wanna make sure the person you select truly will step into your shoes and make the same decisions as you would if you are capable. That kind of ties into as well as being able to separate out one's own emotions. I see this sometimes with adult children. I have a very dear friend who has a great relationship with her parents, <coughs> excuse me, but she has said a few times, if I ever had to withdraw life support sustaining measures, if I had ever pull away treatment from them, I wouldn't be able to. And if her parents had specifically said, you know, if I am at this point in my life or my quality of life isn't such as, I no longer want aggressive treatments, then the person making those medical decisions needs to be comfortable honoring that for them. I often forget how comfortable I am in a medical setting and other people are not. You know, there might be past history or a traumatic experience. A lot of people do not like hospitals. They become very uncomfortable with physicians, that white coat syndrome. And if someone isn't able to advocate on your behalf to be able to maybe question a treatment to be able to request a second opinion, then that person might not be the right person to step into that role either, because you need someone who's truly going to be able to speak on your behalf and feel comfortable doing so. And the last piece that I always recommend people consider when um, looking into who their healthcare agent would be is that person's ability to know what your baseline is. And by baseline, I mean, what is your current cognitive, physical, functional status? Because a lot of the time when you're taken to the ER, when there's a sudden change in your condition, the well-meaning nurses and physicians are acting based on what they're presented with. And we know that medications can cause dizziness and confusion. Dehydration can cause delirium. Uh, as we age, urinary tract infections present very differently. So you might become agitated. You might become very confused. You might become very lethargic and not the typical symptoms that we think of when we think of a UTI. And all of these factors are things that as your healthcare agent, they would be able to know. So that if you were, of, a, for example, of an older age and went into the ER, they might think, oh, this person's 82 agitated, confused, there's probably a dementia diagnosis. Whereas if you had a healthcare agent who was aware of your current status and able to speak on your behalf, they might say, this behavior is brand new. We need to address this immediately, which would get you probably the right treatment plan a lot quicker. Lead on to the next slide. Ryan having some <laughs> problems here. <laughs> um, as Ken mentioned, there is the two of the forms for the Advanced Healthcare Directive are listed at the end in resources. Um, and while an Advanced Healthcare Directive is such an important part of your estate planning and takes on such a big responsibility of naming your healthcare agent, it's a very brief, concise document. It really only lists who you would want to put in that role, maybe an alternate agent, maybe a second alternate. If you would want to donate your organs, if there was any specifications about pain management, but it's typically a very brief document. And a lot of the times people have these great conversations with their attorneys in a conference room, or maybe they have it uh, with a social worker who's helping them complete a form. And then that conversation never goes any further. And the big piece that needs to happen after the fact of selecting who you want to be your agent is making sure not only are they comfortable and willing to take on this role, but do they know what you would want if they had to step into this position? This conversation is usually very daunting for people. 
there's um, sometimes a little bit of pushback. If someone says to you, oh no, I don't want to talk about this, this, I don't want to talk about these scenarios, then honestly, that person probably shouldn't be your healthcare agent. Because I know for myself, when I act in that capacity, I'm almost chomping up a bit to get as much information as I can so that I have a good picture of the person's health history, their current status, and what they want in certain medical um, scenarios, or if they're going towards end of life, you know, how much treatment someone wants. So to kind of break down how to have that conversation, I always recommend people take into account their health history, looking at, you know, what have they previously undergone? Has there been surgical procedures? Have there been any complications? Um, are there any diagnoses that really come into play in your medical decision making? And along with that, you might say, is there also any, you know, what is my current functional status? So right now I'm capable of getting around independently or I need to use a cane, I need to use a walker. And all of these factors kind of play into um, my medical decision-making because they kind of limit maybe what I would feel comfortable with moving forward and also kind of set the scenario of what my current circumstances are. After kind of doing a little bit of a um, rundown of what your current status is and what maybe your past treatments have been, the next piece of this is really to examine what is your quality of life? Because in talking about what your medical decisions would be, what treatments you would be open to, it all comes down to quality of life. And by that, I mean kind of assessing your mobility, pain management, cognitive status, ability to socialize, all of these factors that might determine whether or not you would want to continue to pursue treatments. So you might say, as of right now, I have good quality of life because I'm able to get around independently. I'm able to toilet, to bathe, to eat on my own. I have no pain. I'm able to socialize and I'm able to make med uh, decisions for myself. I have the capacity to do so. And then you kind of ask yourself, well, what is maybe not having quality of life look like? I wouldn't have quality of life if I was bed bound, or I wouldn't have quality of life if I was in great pain, or I couldn't make decisions for myself. I was incapacitated cognitively. And kind of getting a take on what that means to you kind of helps dictate what your values and your wishes are for yourself and how someone else could step in and make those decisions for you. The example I love to use is I typically ask clients, if you were to have dialysis um, three times a week, you were to be, if you couldn't transport yourself, maybe you take a medical transport to a dialysis clinic and you spend most of the day there, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and you come back, would you still have quality of life? Is that, is that a circumstance that you would be comfortable doing if it you know prolonged your life? Maybe you were working towards a um, transplant and this was kind of a life-sustaining treatment. And I've had clients who've said, no, that would be a disruption of my quality of life. I would not want to go out and pursue this level of medical intervention. And I had another client who said, well, yes, I would still have good quality of life because I would have a system in place that cared for me. I would be transported to a center where I would know the nurses and the doctor. I would probably make friends and it would be a little bit of a social interaction for me. And that just reminded me that these questions are so personal. What we view as our quality of life, what we would be comfortable doing, what we would kind of limit um, treatments and life-sustaining measures really is just dependent on each person. And so we can't assume that someone would just know exactly what you would want in these certain scenarios. It's so important to have these conversations and really set the stage because having a conversation when you're fully healthy and capable, your outlook is very different than maybe now there's a diagnosis and maybe now certain scenarios and questions are starting to follow a prognosis that you have and the answers become very different as we age and as our healthcare status changes. 
One um, recommendation as well is there is a video called Continuing the Legacy, a conversation with Carrie Kasem. And it talks about unfortunate circumstances where people have not had these conversations. I believe we have it listed at the end and the resources as well. And it really talks to different scenarios that people have unfortunately been through where there wasn't conversation and hospitals and um, family members have had to act and make decisions without really feeling comfortable. And sometimes those can really stay with people. I, I never feel that someone being in this position is a burden. Most people find uh, great responsibility and great pride and being entrusted to make your medical decisions. But the burden some part comes in if they're having to make decisions for you when they haven't been given kind of the roadmap and information on how to follow what your healthcare wishes would be. So in having the conversation, um, I usually use a kind of question and format um, routine. It kind of serves as my outline, but when I'm talking to people and I'm bringing up different scenarios, I get so much more out of the conversation than just these exact question and answers because it really opens up to their different viewpoints and their different values. So one um, good example of this is CPR. That is usually a big question that you're asked. You know, if I am to hit the ground right now based on my current functional status, based on my current health history, would you want CPR? And then you can kind of follow that path. Okay, now you've received CPR. Now you're going to the hospital. Now they want to put you on a ventilator. Are you open to that? If you are on a ventilator, how long would you be comfortable being on life support? Are there any determining factors on how long you would be comfortable having that level of um, life-sustaining treatment? And then when you have these kind of conversations, people typically have pretty strong feelings on what their responses are. Um, maybe that's from something they've experienced or different statistics they've read. It also usually depends on, like we said, their current functional status and their um, views on quality of life. So if I talk to someone who is fully capable of functioning and moving around and has no limitations, their answer might be very different than someone who has a terminal illness that knows that when their heart is to stop, even if it gets beating again, they might not be able, that illness isn't going away. It's not gonna automatically bring them back to a healthier state. It's just gonna return them to their current baseline. And so what does that look like for them? One thing that I've seen that has been interesting is there has been conversation in hospitals about CPR and resuscitation because it's such a very broad subject. And there's so many different scenarios where it could happen. So you're often asked as either the patient or the medical decision maker, if someone was having a surgery, would you want them to maybe have CPR if something were to go awry? If someone was maybe open to CPR, but not life-sustaining support, then the question sometimes is asked, well, if this person is having surgery, and there's a complication and we need their lungs to have a little bit of a break and we, their heart hasn't stopped, but we need them to be put on manual ventilation just to let the body recover. Are you open to that? And so there's so many different scenarios that kind of come into play, um, but having these type of conversations, even if you don't hit every single subject line, you're really able to give your healthcare agent a good idea of what your views are. Um, and you will have the support of the medical team and any of these kind of circumstances as well. Another subject uh, that comes off comes up quite often is artificial nutrition. So if you had a disease that affected your ability to swallow and a feeding tube would be introduced that had minimal limitations, would you want a feeding tube? Again, a lot of people have very strong feelings often um, about their views on feeding tubes. And for some, it's helpful to kind of go through different scenarios. So maybe you have cancer of the larynx and you are not gonna be able to swallow or take in solid foods by mouth, but you can live a full healthy life with the addition of a G-tube that's inserted, inserted surgically. Would you still have quality of life? If perhaps, you 
continued to have a disease and the disease was continuing to progress and maybe a feeding tube would be inserted, but would allow you just minimal, you know, limitations, would you be open to it then? What if it started to affect your quality of life? What if you were bed bound? What if you couldn't get around on your own? What if you had pain? You know, and kind of just reviewing these different circumstances with people um, can really help your understanding of what they would want in certain circumstances. Another really big question that always comes into play is if you have any type of neurologically degenerative disease or a form of dementia like Alzheimer's, a lot of the times, because that does affect your capacity, your healthcare decision maker is gonna be asked to step in and make all the decisions at some point. And one question that does always come up, because we know that with dementia diagnoses and most neurological um, diseases, you lose that ability to swallow and take in food orally. And so this is a big question that does come up is if people would want a feeding tube. If you were bed bound, unable to speak for yourself, unable to participate in meaningful life, would you want your body sustained? Or is there a certain limit on your cognitive abilities and your quality of life that would allow you to um, have artificial nutrition? I have unfortunately seen the side of this question um, where people have not had the conversation. There was a certain circumstance where there was nine siblings, eight daughters and a son. And the son uh, served as kind of next of kin um, as the oldest. And he made a medical decision for a mother to put a feeding tube in. And all eight daughters were in disagreement. They felt that she would not have wanted this. Um, and the son was actually getting some financial benefit of having the mother, he lived in her home, he received her monthly funds and she was kept kind of in a permanent vegetative state um, with the introduction of the feeding tube. And while for someone, if that was their medical wishes to continue to preserve life, that would be one thing. But in this case, it was pretty evident um, that this, according to the daughters, this is not something she would have wanted. And so it, it's, again, just always a reminder of the importance of having these conversations and electing the right person that you would want to make these decisions for you so that you are not ever in a place where someone who shouldn't be is making them on your behalf. Um, religious and cultural customs are also really important in your decision making. That's a big piece of having the conversation with your surrogate decision maker because again, if that person is able to separate their own belief system and follow what your customs are, that can definitely come into play. Um, a lot of people follow strictly Jewish law or they have certain rituals and traditions um, or limitations to how much care they might want. And so making sure that your surrogate knows that these factors do come into play will not only ensure that you're getting the treatment you would want, but also help them make the decisions. In addition to the advanced healthcare directives um, at the end of our presentation are also two kind of addendums to completing your advanced healthcare directives that help with these question and answer formats. One is called prepare for your care and the other is called the conversation project. And both of those, while they should be used in addendum to the advanced healthcare directive, they can help outline some of these questions and answers to do it in a little bit easier of a format. Most people don't feel comfortable just going down a list of all these questions, whether it's for themselves or leading for a loved one. Um, and so those tools can be really helpful in kind of having these conversations. One question I get a lot is about the five wishes. And the five wishes also should be used in addendum, so jointly with an actual advanced healthcare directive, because a lot of these forms, um, such as the five wishes, are well-meaning, but they do not have a certain language that's needed. Um, for instance, the five wishes doesn't list the disposition of remains, so it's actually not accepted by mortuaries. So for people who thought, oh, I have this power of attorney in place through the five wishes, they weren't kind of hitting roadblocks um, 
So it's always good to still get those standard advanced healthcare directives and then also use some of these other tools to help with the conversation. Yeah, if I can just chime in for one issue. Yeah, the five wishes, those types of documents are not enforceable as healthcare directives. That's why Katie's saying, not legally enforceable, that's why she's saying they're addendum to your advanced healthcare directive uh, and they help um, with a lot of the issues, but you need to uh, have an enforceable document and they are not. And I'll also say one other thing, uh, well, two other th well, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a healthcare provider. Um, my understanding in talking to many people in the healthcare community is that CPR is not like it is on television. So you need to have some pretty frank discussions with uh, um, your healthcare providers or people who know what CPR is and, and generally know what the success rate is. And I'm not talking about the success rate in terms of just keeping you alive, but um, not having damage as a result of uh, um, the delays in, in resuscitating you. So it's, it's important to not think of it as, as you see it on TV. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to discuss is the PULST. So the Physician's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. And this often gets confused with the advanced healthcare directives. Again, this is something that should be used in tandem with advanced healthcare directive. It doesn't replace. Um, a POLST is an actual physician's order. So it's not signed by an attorney. It's not completed in a law office. It needs to be completed either with your primary care physician, an oncologist, or sometimes done in the hospital. It is a form that can be, should be transported to each medical setting. They are working in Ventura County to have a, a database for the POLST. But for most people, I always recommend you fill out the form, you make sure your physician has it, you turn it into the hospital, it gets lost, and you keep extras on you. Um, some people think of this as a DNR, which is half correct. It can be a do not resuscitate, or it can be what's called um, full code. So it gives the options whether or not you want CPR. It's for anybody who is seriously ill at any age. So whereas an advanced healthcare directive, you really should do after the age of 18, a POLST is really only done if there is an actual need to have one done. Um, sometimes it's recommended before surgery, or sometimes if someone has a certain diagnosis, a doctor will recommend one is completed. If you are ever in a skilled nursing, um, so we'll want to have one on file. And if you go to the next slide, I have an example of what it looks like. So it's a pretty basic form, section A talking about if you would want CPR, whether you would attempt resuscitation or do not attempt resuscitation. Section B goes into the level of interventions you would have. So if you are an attempt CPR in section one, then you would automatically be full treatment in section B. Um, or if you were a do not resuscitate, there's selective treatment or comfort focused. And none of this is ever set in stone. So similar to the advanced healthcare directives and the um, questions, I should say, that you're asked and just the different scenarios to be discussed with your decision maker, the pulse can always be addendum that it can always be corrected what you put in place when you are maybe at a certain age or a certain place in your health status might change by the time maybe there's a terminal diagnosis or you have a different outlook on whether or not how much aggressive treatment you would want. Section C covers if you would want uh, artificial nutrition, so a feeding tube, and there's either long-term, a trial period, or no artificial nutrition. Um, it discussed if you have an advanced healthcare directive or not. Again, this is kind of used in a lot of medical settings as almost like a cheat sheet to know exactly what your healthcare wishes are. And in addition to having the physician who you're completing it with, it has room for either the patient or the legally recognized decision maker. 
So as well, your advanced healthcare directive needs to be completed by yourself, a pulse can actually be signed by a decision maker. So the person who's made um, the healthcare agent in your advanced healthcare directive can actually complete the pulse for you if it has not been done. And lastly, these are just some lessons um, that I've learned being a medical social worker, um, working in the field of being a healthcare agent for some of my clients through solo aging and also working in home health and hospice. I have seen people who plan ahead and have these conversations and the difference between someone who's maybe had a recent diagnosis and now their viewpoints have changed to someone who is on hospice and perhaps has never had the conversation. I have seen far too many times a family opening up an estate planning binder that has dust on it that no one has opened in 20 years and the family member not knowing that they were the power of attorney for healthcare. So that lets you know right there, they were never given any instructions or any feedback on what that person wanted. And that can be very daunting to now feel responsible to make the right decisions. Um, so the conversation, first of all, needs to be had and then needs to continue and to evolve with, um, as, as we age and as things change. We've seen with COVID-19 how much there's been just big changes in medicine and treatments. I've had clients who have been very set on never wanting to be put on a ventilator. I don't want CPR. And then when I asked them about COVID, they said, well, that's a different circumstance. I would want to be on a ventilator if I had COVID. And so there's very different viewpoints people have about certain um, medical ailments that could affect them. And it's always important to continue to have these conversations as different uh, experimental trials come up. And there might be certain circumstances that people have you know, very strong viewpoints at that might surprise you. Um, advanced healthcare directives are general, like we said. So having these additional tools to lead the conversation is very important and they help guarantee that you will talk to someone about them versus um, the conversation never leaving the attorney's office. Advanced healthcare directives I've seen um, are typically not discussed with medical providers either. Usually it takes a urgent matter in the hospital before someone's maybe primary care physician or oncologist really are even told what their wishes are. So kind of being open to having these conversations is so important. More doctors are becoming more comfortable and there are becoming more incentives for them to have conversations. Unfortunately, everything is money driven in the healthcare field, but there's still so much that's not talked about. Um, and unfortunately, myself and Ken have both seen when there is no advanced planning, and sometimes people need to have a conservatorship. It is a very, very expensive process. It's a lengthy process. And there are people um, in the community who can serve as a conservator, whether it's a family member or hiring of a fiduciary. But sometimes that person did not know who you were at all. They have no idea what you wanted, how your life was. And now just by the rule of the court, they're having to step into this role. And so to prevent anybody who's never met you from having to step in and being well-meaning, but not knowing exactly what you wanted, um, the way to prevent that is to do your advanced healthcare planning. Thank you so much. And I think now we can probably open it up to any questions. If I could just say a couple things before we get to the questions. Um, in the resources section, uh, Katie mentioned the Casey Kasem video. So that's at the uh, on the website of the Ventura County Coalition for Compassionate Care, um, and you know it's available on the front page. Actually, the website is about to be updated uh, or changed entirely, but Casey Kasem is there uh, in the current version and will be in the new version whenever that goes live. Um, and for any of you who may know people in the healthcare community, uh, there's going to be a training that's sponsored by the Ventura County Coalition for Compassionate Care. Uh, about pulses for healthcare professionals. Uh, a lot of times the pulses are completed with the assistance of staff people in a doctor's office, and then the doctor comes in and looks real quickly and signs off on it. Um, and then there's also times where 
posts are inconsistent uh, in the uh, box up here in Section A. It says if you're saying CPR, then you need to put full treatment, but sometimes they're not done properly. And, and the healthcare community needs to be trained. And, and this training is both for the people who assist uh, patients in filling them out and also the people in, in the ER and ICU who are uh, a front line and trying to interpret them. And that's on September 27th. So now I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, there is at least, well, maybe three questions in the chat. Um, but, you know, we could maybe start with those. Um, uh, all right. um, okay, the first question.